There are no technological dif difficulties today, so we're actually a minute early. I'm gonna mute everyone. You can't unmute yourselves. So we are one minute or minute and a half early. I'm gonna get everything situated. We got Girl Scout cookies everywhere. Some, some muscle milk, not some muscle milk, is it? Some muscle milk. Do we have like a UT, is that just a UT thing on it or flavoring? Logo? It's like, what? That's awesome. One of the, one of the, it was like, I think it was a football player. He brought me one of like the Gatorade muscle milks. Yeah. Yeah. So like, um, he's just like, he's like, hey, Brian, I want you to try this. Cause I was talking about like, I was like, I'm drinking muscle milk. I don't, it's pretty good. It's pretty good stuff. We got some, we got some chat going. We're a minute early right now. It's like, <laughs> does anyone here know Mitch Hedberg? Have you guys ever listened to Mitch Hedberg comedy? And maybe someone online knows Mitch Hedberg. Samoas. We have, we have Finn Mints in class. Mitch Hedberg had a thing about Gatorade. If, if you want over the weekend to watch some pretty decent comedy, just look up Mitch Hedberg on YouTube. And his comment, I, I'm totally going to butcher this joke, but he's like, I don't see why Gatorade is advertised as a sport drink. They should just say Gatorade for guys who like to sit around or something. Like, he's a total pothead, but I butchered his joke. If someone knew him, they'd be like, Brian, that's the worst joke ever. But like, he's like, maybe I just like to drink sports flavored drinks. <laughs> I don't know. All right, we are, we are on class time right now. Do we have any visitors from other classes? Sometimes we're on class, we get that. Hey, what's up? Grab some cookies. We got cookies in class. No Samoas. I just want to play my guitar. So I'm sitting in my backyard with a lawn chair, my laptop, my guitar. That is awesome. We even got some video from it. <laughs> we should, maybe I'll unmute, unmute you. Uh, so maybe, maybe. Okay. So last class, we were talking about decision trees. So we finished off with actually making some decision trees. So today we're gonna to do some final analysis of decision trees and then we're gonna go hardcore review. So we're gonna go through all the different types of questions we could possibly have with the review. So let's start thinking about this. I'm gonna go through a lot of the pitfalls I see people have on the exam. I've been giving this exam for like seven years. So make sure to take notes on things like interpreting the slope, interpreting R squared, and we'll circle back to that. So here we are with doing some decision trees. Let's go ahead and pin some video and get ourselves going. Are there any questions that people have right now? Probably go light on the extra credit today. Um, is it not recording? Oh, it's recording, it's not recording here though, that's fine. It's like, why would it not be recording? Okay, how are my onliners doing? I'm not hearing anything from my onliners. Yes, it is recording. You're being recorded, fantastic. Five points to fantastic Addison over there. Great, good. Onliners, so anyone else? Do we have one visitor today? Just one visitor? No other visitors? I say hey, visitors. Okay. It's funny, like sometimes at the end of the semester, we'll come to class and there'll be like 10 people singing the floor and I'll be like, hey, what do you know? So here we are. Let's open up, jump, and take a look at some data. It looks like we have not been reset. So we're gonna make a decision tree here and we're gonna analyze it from start to finish. We're gonna talk a little bit about the theory about decision trees too and how they work. It looks like we lost our data, that's all right. To go and get the data, we're just going to hop on. Oh no, did I take the data down? No, 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 because the data might be gone. Let's see, uh, web.utk.edu, that's not what it for. Uh, UTK, EDU, B. Stevens. What is the name of my Stats 1 web page? All web, there it is. Okay, we're going to the Stats 1 homepage. And let's see if Brian still has the data there for the project. Hopefully I do, because we're gonna use that data projects. Please tell me I didn't take it down. Nope, didn't take it down. So we are going to download the jump results. I wanted it to one click download. It sends you to this page you have to download, but you know, it works. So with this open right here, we're opening up the jump data for the project. Got some, here we go. Can you explain what happens to R squared as we split the data in the decision tree? Let's look at that. Big question today is what happens to R squared as we put more splits into our decision tree? And we are going to find that answer out. What is the best way? We'll talk about best ways. We're gonna to get to studying for the test here in just a moment. So 
let's go ahead and make a decision tree and I'll increase the font. So what shall we predict today, guys, with the decision tree, guys and gals? Five points, someone tell me what to predict. Coupons, which number is that? What number was it? Did you see coupon usage? 51? Yes. Say, say, you can tell your teacher, Brian, give me five points. Is it, or is it, you do, you're one of mine. Okay, I heard the voice over there and I couldn't tell. So here we are. We're using coupon usage and we're gonna see what helps explain people using coupons. Now we might run into some preliminary problems, but what you notice is, is I have both categorical and quantitative data in my decision tree. You can predict a categorical, you can predict a quantitative. You can use categoricals and quantitative variables as the X's. So decision trees take everything but things that are, starts with an I. Decision trees should not take identifiers or things that act like identifiers. So we might see some weirdness here. Five points to all those identifier people. So let's see, and we see it. Number of Facebook friends is miscoded. So all I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to eliminate that variable from the tree. It's number 64. And hopefully we don't run into another problem, but I suspected we would. So identifiers should not be in there because they cause problems. Let's split again, and we see major. I knew that one, that's my fault, because major is the classic one that you would think would not be a problem, but because of the way people wrote in major. So once again, what I am showing right here is we cannot have identifiers or things that act like identifiers. Now we got it working. Make a nice symmetric tree right here, and here we are. Good, nice symmetric tree. Color the points and remove the excess data. So now we have a decision tree filled with um, the quantitative and categorical variables, which is all of them. When a decision tree makes its splits, it actually looks through every single variable for the best one to split on. It could split on the same variable twice, but it looks through all of them every time. It's like, how do I, how do I split this data up to make these groups the best possible? It's all right, I do love this example, but the R squared is rather low. Now what happens to the R squared as we increase the splits? And we can view this in the split history. The R squared must always do what? Every time we increase a split, it will always go up. So if you notice, the R squared is always, 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 I think that was the question, the R squared will always go up. Because what do X's do? X's like to explain. The X's explain, and all I'm doing is putting in more X's. It's using another X to make more splits. And it's all right, this is not the best of trees, because sometimes it's really hard to predict stuff. But we're gonna go back to a little bit smaller of a tree, with just this four variable tree right here. And here's a four variable tree, just a four split tree, I should say. Actually, I lie, it's a three split tree, because it has four leaves. These are the four terminal leaves of a tree. Now if you look, here's our never used coupon people. Do you see group one, group two, group three, group four. Group what is the one that has the most people or most percentage of people who say they never use coupons? Group one, group two, group three, or group four? Group number two. Group number two, Let's talk as loud as you want in this class. Five points to Emma and five points in the back of the class. Group two, and where do you notice group two down here? The second one right here, do you see that large red portion? It's the same thing as this. It's literally this graphic right here. This graphic here is this graphic here. This is also one of the smaller leaves. It's not the smallest. The first one's the smallest with 145, just barely smaller. The two bigger leaves are 361 and 356. That's how many dots there are inside of there. Does that make sense? And how did we divide these people up? Well, let's try it ourselves. Have you ever shopped at a physical store online? Has anyone ever uh, purchased, wait, physical store to purchase online? Okay, so here's the question. Did you ever go to a physical store and then decide to purchase something online after you went to look at it in a physical store? Yes, I see a lot of yeses there. And look, look at, there were 717 people who said yes to that. But this is an X variable here. This is not what we're trying to predict. The whole point of this tree is that we're trying to predict Coupon usage, exactly for another five points. We're trying to predict coupon usage, so that's an X variable, that's an explanatory variable. So we'd ask them, did you go to a physical store to try to figure out if you wanted to purchase something online and then purchase it online? 770 people said yes, 332 said no. So if you said yes to that, the next thing I would ask you 
is what? I would ask you another X variable to explain your coupon usage, and I would ask you, what is? And that's only if you go down the yes path. If you went down the no path, I would ask you, what do you predict your starting annual salary to be? It really depends on how you answer the questions. At the end, you will end up in one of these groups. And then this group, whatever it is, will predict your coupon usage. Now I'm gonna to go to a little bit like example where we get a higher R squared, and I might have to use like a one we've already done, but this is a great example right here, and it's just predicting coupon usage. So we're gonna switch the variable for the moment, and let's predict something easy to predict, which, watch me do worse. <laughs> I'm gonna to try to get a better R squared. Broken bone, did we do broken bone last time? Because I'm hoping that's the one we did during the review, or I did? Oh, I did? Because it's usually an easier one, because why? Who likes to break bones? Guys. And then we split again. And that's a weird Confederate statues is where we split next. Why are guys breaking bones? Oh, no! I, who do you feel bad for right now? Well, we can split again. What's going to happen next? Reviewed business on social media. <laughs> Who's breaking those bones? Who's breaking bones? The youngest male who's doing what? Guys aren't breaking bones, they're breaking Oh no, I like that, five points. Guys aren't breaking bones, they're breaking hearts. So, uh, the youngest males who have reviewed, who have not reviewed a business, where the, is, are those businesses coming after them? Probably, this might just be random, you think so? This might just be randomness at the end, we maybe split the trees too far, but we have algorithms later on when we show you how to do this at a higher level that decides when to stop splitting the tree. We've got much better ways of doing this than just randomly doing it. But it, it is splitting it each time I ask it to split it. And I'm asking it, and look, how much better, wait, I'm gonna bring it back to a three, a four split, three split tree with four leaves. <coughs> Whose model did better? And I'm throwing you another five points. Whose model explains better the Y variable? The first or the second? Which one explains the Y variable better? The first or the second? The first model or the second model explains the Y variable better? The first and why? I'll five points to all those online first people. Why the first? It's R squared is higher. R squared is the ability to explain. 3% of the variation in coupon usage is explained by this decision tree. 2.9% of the variation in broken bone is explained by this decision tree. You beat me for another five points. So I said, I'm gonna do better. And I didn't. So, you know, it is, there's some really good stuff in here that you can predict better, but this is not a very good explanatory model, this decision tree. It doesn't explain a lot of the variation. So, don't worry, Scott, don't worry. This is just practice right here. But you know what we can do? We can get the leaf report. And the leaf report lets us see inside of these leaves. To review, which leaf, one, two, three, or four, has the most broken bones? One, and they're kind of all equally sized, a little bit, one's smaller, but it's a little equal size. You see like 200, 300, 200, 200. One is the smallest, but uh, you know, they're not tiny, tiny leaves. Like some over here were smaller. That doesn't matter, but you can see the widths of the bars are the leaves, right? So now we also see which group had the least broken bones. One, two, three, or four. And look down here. One has the most broken bones, four has the least broken bones. When you get to the leaf report, which is the other thing we know how to read, is we can go here and we can see leaf one, leaf two, leaf three, leaf four. Does that make sense? And you can also see how they fell into these leaves here, like what classification they had. But check this out. What do you think 67 plus 121 is? 188. Well, how many people in the overall data set, like up here, how many people have broken a bone? What would you do to get that number? Add up all the what's. Add all the yeses up. Because they all, like, this yes group plus this yes group plus this yes group plus this yes group is all the yeses up here. Whereas these numbers, watch this. If I prune below here, well, guess what? That 495 is leaf number one now. It's the very first leaf, because that's the end of it, like a branch with the leaves at the end. And then we can see that there are 273 people who broke a bone. So when I split here, guess what 121 plus 152 adds up to? 273. Because it's basically just joining that all together. It's joining these numbers down here. This lets you see the numbers inside of each of this, as in this red thing right here. And just go from left to right, 
first, second, third, fourth, left to right. This red amount of people is how many people right here? Be able to read this, be able to understand this. That red group is how many people? 67. The next group, the next blue group is how many people? 121. The next one is how many people? And then the next one is 152. What does that add up to? Do you see where these numbers come from and how they're being used here? So this is, oh, we got some, I think, nope, I think maybe that's excitement, girls, maybe. So this is a good lecture to review, and you said, is that the chapter review video where I do it? Yeah. And so I think we'll take a few more questions on decision trees, and we're right about to transfer into review now. Questions? As splits increase, R squared increases. So when you split, you will increase R squared. We know when to stop splitting when R squared kind of levels off. R squared can't go down. Um, if you see any downness, that's just because Brian can't draw. Um, but R squared will kind of level off, and we really don't get into it too much in this class because there's really good ways to figure out when to stop splitting it, dealing with holdout samples and all these other things that are advanced topics. But R squared will increase every time we make a split because it, it explains. X is explained if we're able to make a split. There's also the instance where you can't make a split. If you can't make a split, then R squared can't increase, so the tree would not split. How do you predict how much R squared increases by? Um, that'd be really hard. Uh, we don't really do that. Uh, you could maybe predict it, but we'll never ask you to do something like that, so do not worry, but uh, that'd be rather interesting. I might be able to do that, but that, that'd be interesting. I like that. Abby, for five points, I like that. You, you just know, so you know if you put another X in to make another split. If you, you don't choose the X, it chooses the X for you, the best one, right? So it's choosing this. Like if I remove this split right here, if I prune it, what do you think it's gonna split? Well, I'm asking it to split there, but let me prune this, and where do you think it's gonna split? Do you see every time, I just have something for symmetric trees. So every time I ask it to split here, it'll split in the same variable when I ask it to do that. Does that make sense? So every time it splits on that, it'll split on the same variable. But that's not because it has to choose that variable, it's because that's the best variable. So it will choose the best variable to split on. And so every time I have it split there, it'll constantly split on that variable right here because it's gonna choose the best one. So it'll always be that variable. Are there any more questions about decision trees? You guys look so excited today. Get some cookies, we got Girl Scout cookies in class. We had M and M's, or girls' cookies. So, and let's let's make sure while we're in class here, let's do a quick review. This now we're transitioning to test review. So we got the announcements right here. The test is tomorrow night at six thirty to eight. I printed like fourteen hundred copies of it. Like I'm just like holy mackerel. Please let all the copies look all right. Please let them say the coffee machines didn't break down or something. Why does it have a lock on it? This topic is closed for comments. I made that a topic. Did you guys get this announcement yesterday with the red? The reason uh, this is so important that you show up to the right room is if you guys remember when we were trying to get the rooms booked and there was another date, I'm not gonna say what that date was, I thought it was today, but when there was another date for the exam, we were really trying to get that date and we had a hard time booking rooms because right now with the student union closed and they have like alumni books for everything, usually we use alumni and you can put like six, 700 students in alumni, which means we can put five or six sections in alumni, and that's like half of our students. But without alumni, we have to be like, okay, here's a 200 person classroom, here's a 150 person classroom, and it's very hard to get all the rooms booked on one night at that time. So we went through this big scheduling nightmare, and it was very hard because last semester, they didn't have alumni booked every night, and we actually used it for exam one, exam two, and it was very easy booking. So besides all the troubles, that's why we are split. There's only two classes, and we're one of them. Sorry, guys. There's only two classes that are split. One of Missy's classes, one of our classes. Make sure you know your name. I think you know that. <laughs> and then you know where you're going because of your last name. Do not get confused by this. We will be checking the last names when we grade them or turn them in. You will lose 10 points. The problem is, is because each room does not have many extra seats. You will probably be you know, closer to students. Hopefully, it's a little bit nicer of a room but you'll be closer to students. You know your name, no problems there, good Megan. So Megan Rodriguez is going to be in Daughtery Engineering 426, so also look this up, SMCG2 is next to Haslam, it's just that little underground patio area. 
So make sure you know where you are going. So double check this. Don't just ask your friend like, where's the exam? They might be in another section. It's in the announcement right here. This was also, I think you guys also saw it last week because I think I sent it out last week right here on the 11th. So that was sent out last week, a good bit of a while ago. So G2, lucky. <laughs> and so there it is right here. And we have all the people with the exam conflicts signed up, I hope by now. And yes. So that's what's going on there. Any questions about what's going on with the exam tomorrow night? 6.30 to 8. I don't think it's so bad. It's a very fair exam. I've seen it, of course. And <laughs> means I get 100 on it. Is that, is that what you said? Preston said, Preston said he asked his chemistry teacher, like, what do you think of the exam? Just, I'm at 100. <laughs> so, <laughs> any exceptions? Any exceptions to what? I don't, I don't know what exceptions. Um, so we've updated this right here to the 21st and the 26th. The other exam is on a Monday. I think that's the second Monday back from spring break. So once we get back, it is right. So we get back, have a week, and then we have the exam, right? This, the second exam is shorter on material. So I do tell you this much. If you do bad on the first exam, like let's say you're an AB student and you make a C on the exam. So you're like, oh man, I made a C. The second exam has less material. Immediately start doing the assignments. There's less topics, there's less material. You're like, I'm gonna destroy this. It's worth more of your grade than the first, and it has less material. So realize that the second exam is a lot of where people usually bounce back. So don't freak out. Second exam, less material. Dick's right, don't fail. Um, we, I'm, I'm thinking, well, no, no. I think the average for a class, I'm going to call it now. Study hard, guys. I'm about to show you what to study. I think the average for a class is going to be, I'm going to say this. I'm going to go high here. You ready? I'm going to say an 82. I'm going to go 82. <coughs> I've, seen, I've seen craziness. What was I've seen, what? Last year's? Last year's? was not as high as 82. <laughs> Last year, everyone was lower. But here's the thing. When you go to exam prep, so we've got a lot of great exam prep right here. You've got the topics. Um, this is just the PDF. Um, so what you'll notice is this is Brian's key to how to study. So, and I will, these are posted like a week in advance of the test. Like this, will, this page will change here that says exam prep. Does that make sense? The exam prep chain page will change and it has the topics. You need to be able to basically explain to somebody what is going on right here, how to calculate the range in the IQR when you're given Q1 and Q3. We'll never make you solve for Q1 and Q3. There is multiple choice. There is probably some multiple choice. You know, this is a gambit of questions. Looks a lot like the practice test. But you need to know how, if you're given Q1 and Q3 in output, how to calculate. But we're not going to have you calculate Q1 and Q3. It's a little laborious. But then you also need to know how to calculate the range, max minus min. No one to use the mean and Oh, standard deviation. I thought, that would, I thought it should say standard deviation. S is the notation for standard deviation. I wrote this. I probably should have put standard deviation there. Versus median and IQR. S is the notation for sample mean, though. Interpretate, interpretating. <laughs> Interpretation of the median, mean, IQR, quantiles, range, and standard deviation, which you did on your project. Interpreting the shape, center, spread, and unusual features of a histogram. So there's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot. Know what the five-number summary is. All these different things. Question. Sure, that's a weird one. It could appear, you never know. But the standard deviation, whatever the value is, here we'll do one here. I'll interpret a standard deviation for you. Wrong button. Make that go away. To interpret a standard deviation, and I'm going to go to some big highlights, things I always talk about. Look at all those pretty colors. So a standard deviation is a measure of spread. The standard deviation for this distribution is 0 0.40, which tells us the typical spread of people's GPAs from the mean is about 0 0.40 points. This could be used in a normal model. But I think if you just said the typical spread of people's GPAs from the mean GPA is about 0 0.403. It's the spread of GPAs. If you look right here, the mean is 3.78, and that's where the big spike is because it's a little bit normally distributed, which means the mean and standard deviation. I know we have an outlier or so, but the bulk of the data. And we usually try to give you guys something clean, like you know, we might clean up the outliers or we might make it more obvious that outliers exist. Does that make sense? So this is not a perfect test question here because you might say, oh, there's outliers. I should use median, right? But if we put it as a test question, I'd probably do something like clean up the outliers. Does that make sense? So if I were to talk about the mean and standard deviation, the mean would be the average GPA 
for students in this data set was a GPA of 3.78. The standard deviation tells us that the spread from the mean is about 0 0.40 GPA points. You see how I said GPA points in context? Because the standard deviation is a measure of spread from the mean. So it tells us how far out values are typically spread from the mean. Can you provide us with, the two, with 200 answer keys? <laughs> sure. How many questions is this test? I think it's like 14 pages. But I mean, some pages have like three questions. And people, people freaked out. Like, you know, when you take a look, like, let's look at how a page on the test can look. Do not freak out that it's 14 pages. Because when you look at the practice exam, the practice, practice exam, I can't speak today, is how many pages? Is 20 pages. Maybe, maybe it's 17 pages. So the practice exam is 20 pages. So you got a cover page here. Then you got a score page there. Then you got a formula page there. So, you know, and then you got a true false page here. So number five, part B on the picture. Sure, let's go over, let's go over one of the practice exam questions. I'm going to cover some major stuff. But, you know, not every page, and look, you got graphics on these pages. Does that make sense? So there's pages that are not, like, over-encumbered with, you know, answers. This page only has six points for the questions. And one of them is circle yes, no. So, you know, this page right here, this is a meaty page. This is a page with a lot of points. But, so I'm gonna go back to 5B, and then let's, let's do 5B, see what people want for 5B. Cool. Is this one right here, five, are you asking about this one right here? Yes. So with this question, let's look at this right here. We're gonna, we're gonna do five right here to do z-scores and review chapter five. Right now we are reviewing chapter five, which is using z-scores and the normal model. So with this, I thought it was a Batman watch like mine. <laughs> it looked a little, it's got the metal. Sorry, I got to, that looks like my watch. So, <laughs> calculate the z-score for a battery that lasted two years under normal. There you go. Watch batteries and everything. We know what's going on, our cell phone batteries. So here's the thing, the data is normally distributed. A particular brand of cell phone batteries will last under normal conditions 2.5 and the data is normally distributed. So we know we can use the normal. Does that make sense to everybody? So now what do we do? This is the hard part and I ask you if you're practicing right now, do this yourself because I'm gonna cheat to display it up here. When you draw the normal curve, so draw your normal curve, right? What are you gonna put at the center of your normal curve? This is practice for the test. If you were doing this now on your sheet of paper, you're practicing, you're gonna draw your normal curve and you're gonna put the mean, Abby for five points says, we're gonna put the mean at the very center of 2.5. And then you're gonna go up one what? Z-score, standard deviation. So you could put zero one, but let's do it in context of the problem. So with this right here, we're gonna go up 0 0.32, which would make the first time we go up 2.82. Then we'll go up again and we'll go to 3.14 and then 3.46, right? Going down kind of breaks your brain a little bit. You'd go down 3.32 to 2.18 and to one point, I'm gonna mess it up, 7.6, uh-oh, no, 1.86, is it 8.6? 1.86, so there we go. 1.86, five points to the people correcting me, I like it. And then go down again to 1.54, right? And here's the thing, if you had a computer in this moment, which once again, we just gave those numbers to prove we could do it. If you had a computer, which you won't on the test, you could just put in 2.5 and 0 0.32 and you get your answers. Like that. 18 plus 14 is 32, I should have done that in my head. Now, it's, it's very interesting because we almost have what we should be displaying here. I think it asked what percent of batteries will last longer than two, right? Two hours or two years, whatever the units of two was. What percent of batteries will last longer than two years? So it wants us to calculate the Z-score first, but here's the thing. I can tell you that the Z-score has to be between what and what for this. The Z-score has to be between, careful, closer, bingo for 10 points right there, negative one, and negative two. Now, whenever you do this, I beg of you to make sure underneath this curve you have your standard normal. Does that make sense? So keep the standard normal on the curve. If you notice, we were right about here, I think. 
So we're going to reverse time. Can I reverse time on this? It used to work. 2.5 and 0 0.32. And we were right here. That's exactly between negative 1 and negative 2. Now, that didn't solve the question for us, but we do know that the z-score we get when we solve this has to be between those numbers. We can see it. So make sure to put on your curve 0, negative 1, negative 2. Secondly, all you have to write because you know it's between negative 1 and negative 2. To find a z-score, all we're doing is finding how far away that observation is from the mean. The formula is observation, which we observe 2, minus the mean, which is 2.5. And does that make sense that 2 is 0.5 below the mean? Well, that's how far it is below. Now we're going to turn that distance into a z-score by dividing it by the standard deviation. Because a z-score is just how many standard deviations something is above or below the mean. And look at this. If you drew this really well, does that look to be about negative 1.56 standard deviations below the mean? It does. And now be careful. This is where the question is confusing. Because this negative 1.56, the 1.56 has nothing to do with this line, like the numbers on it right now. It means I am 1.56 standard deviations below the mean. It's just coincidental that the numbers, like the ones and the twos here, look similar in, in like size. So I am 1.56 standard deviations below the mean. So we actually drew our graphic for the next problem. So I went observation. It's y minus y bar. If you want to write this down, it is and 10 points in the chat for anyone typing up the z-score equation. So type it in the chat right now to remind yourself of it. y minus y bar over s which is observation of 2 minus the mean of 2.5 over the S, which is our standard deviation. Observation minus mean over standard deviation. All those 10 points in the chats, love it. Observation minus mean over standard deviation, which is Y minus Y bar over S. Y was our observation. Y bar is the mean. And then S is the standard deviation. Question. Could the entirety of the exam tell us what you want to do? Yeah, it says to two digits, and everything should be fine to two digits. I think there's some that you could pay, probably do to four, but I mean, you're not going to randomly guess a 0.67 or 0.21. You know, like, I think I'm waiting for people to be like, wait, we should have told them to round to four on this. And I'll be like, they're not going to guess. I mean, you know, you can round to four. It, it says on the page, cover page, like, round to two digits, but you could always put more if you want. Don't worry. I had someone who put all the decimal place accuracy of his calculator. <laughs> all right. Let's do it. Oh, man. Megan, another 10 points. Megan's, Megan, I'm going to give Megan more. She, she's writing it out more. I'm, <laughs> I'll give you double, but that's I'm stopping it on double. Okay, so now the next question asks, well, what percent of people would have this battery that lasts longer than two? What percent of people? Well, we have a visual here. What if I told you it was 10%? Well, that shaded area doesn't look like 10% to me, does it? No, I mean, just come up with a fake number and guess it. Now, we wouldn't ask you a test question like this, but just come up with a number. Whoa, wait, wait, that black area is only 20% of the curve? Careful. Yeah, I hear 92%, 75%. I'm liking it. I mean, it could be, right? I mean, yeah, we're getting some ideas right here, right? So we know it has to be a bigger number. But here's the thing what I've seen. I've seen people tell me an answer that is like 2.5%. And do you know what they're doing? They're doing the white area, right? They're doing the reverse. So when we say above this, it's the bigger area. So kind of put a number in your head and be like, hmm, it's going to be a bigger number. That's going to be like 80, 90, 75. It's going to be a bigger number. So now we're going to create, we're going to create a small interval here to contain it. The way we create this small interval I'm going to do it to you guys ready. We're going to go to snipping tool. We're going to do this in paint. If you watch, um, I do have videos on this. So if you watch the videos in the videos, I uh, do some graphic animations. Has anyone watched the videos and they liked them or you hated them? <laughs> they help. And I show the graphics to do it. So check out the videos. I highly suggest them. I put a bit of time into them, but we're about to do the same thing here. They were groovy. I like that. So you guys ready for this? Here we are with the arrows. Arrowed. So I am going to make an arrow error right here, wrong way. There we go, this arrow. Let's make it red. Make it blue. I like blue better. So here is my arrow. Please tell me, Brian, from your arrow over is too blank of an area. 
from that arrow over is too blank of an arrow area. Is too small of an area. Scott got it for five points. Too small of an area. Because if we went from here over, does everyone see here, over is too small. Does that make sense? Use your arrows. Now, what percent of area is from the middle over? That's an easy one, right? Well, then between negative one and one is how much area? Yeah. You already broke it down. 68. And then between the two, like, one of those areas is worth what? So does everyone see we broke this down from 68 to 34 and 34? Does that make sense? So now, guess what? If this is 34 and from here over is 50, what's the long arrow worth? 84%. Does that, is, does that make logical sense to everybody how I found that? And the video goes into a little bit more detail. Like, I definitely show all these numbers. And because this was worth 34 and from here over is worth 50. So then we do the next one. You might already see it happening. And if you know the extra cheat numbers, it's, it's a little bit easier. But now we do the next arrow, right? And th these go to infinity. They just go from there over. Like they cover the whole rest of the curve. They don't stop. It just goes completely over. So if you do know this number, you know this number is 13.5. But pretend you don't know it. There's an easy way, and we could do this in an even easier way. You ready for this? What percent of areas between negative 2 and 2? How much? 95. What percent is outside of negative 2 and 2? If 95 is inside, what's outside? 5, and then what's one of my hands worth? So what is below here? Below here is what? 2.5. If below here is 2.5%, what is above here? Bingo. And you can check a lot of your math because below this one would have to be 16%. Does that make sense? That below this one is 16 because the other, the other way going down would be 16. So we've broken it down and this would be great to write on the test. You just have to make sure that, okay, 95 inside, five outside, 2.5. Don't get confused on the numbers though because sometimes you'll say 2.35, but that's because between here is 2.35 and between here is 0 0.15. The area, between here is 13.5%. Cool question. And then the area between here is 34, and then it repeats. These are the areas between, and if you add them up, you should get the numbers. So 50% from there over, but you can check the numbers. Does this make sense to everybody what I've done here? I've used the 68, 95, 99.7 rule to break it down, and I have all the numbers. Also 0 0.15, 2.35, 13.5, 34, which comes from the empirical rule. Question. Mm -hmm. like, like, 97.5%. Um, go ahead. Why what? Oh, like why is it? Well, because what we're doing here is we're creating the smallest interval. Because if we were to go from, let me go right here. If we were to go at 1.86 over, that would be too much. And you see there's the 97.5. This is more exact. This gives very exact numbers here. And then if we go from 2.18 over, that's too little. And that's the 84 we figured out. And so that number has to be between those two. Yeah, there you go. So we, we boxed it in. Yeah, it has to be between those two. And like I keep saying, the empirical rule is always an estimate because if we're going to use um, like 68.26 is actually one, this is why like our numbers sometimes turn out a little bit different. 95.45 is two, and then the other one's 99.73. You do not need to know the more decimals. That's why if you're like, why does the calculator turn out a little bit different? It's because it's very exact. It's usually like very exact decimal place accuracy. But think about this. If we have the middle 95%, is that basically two? Negative two and positive two. How about the middle 68? Is that basically one and negative one? And then you look at the last one here, 99.7. Is that basically th negative 3 and 3, basically? And then that makes it negative 3 and 3. But then there's even more decimals. Like, decimals go on infinitely. So that's why we just say 68, 95, 99.7 instead of 68.26, 95.45, 99.73. 68, 95, 99.7. There's, there's more decimals if you wanted to carry them out. Um, Wait, so are you using two instead of the z-score? Um, so the question here, Abby, when, and we'll go back to our graphic here. Here's our graphic. 
So this was the z-score of, let's put a note in here, z-score of negative 1.56. So this right here was a z-score of negative 1.56. And then if we go to a z-score of 2, because that's where a z-score of negative 2, excuse me, z-score of negative 2, what percent of area is above a z-score of negative 2? 97.5. What percent, what percent of area is above a z-score of negative 1? And ours is between there. Does that make sense? Does that make sense why we're doing it, why I use negative 2 and negative 1? Because ours is between those numbers, so the area has to be between those, those amounts. So... I think that makes more sense. What if we are just a little off in our answers? Usually we try to be nice in the grading, but here's the biggest thing. Know the numbers. I don't think it's too much to, well, you can use 68.95, 99.7, but if you memorize 0.15, 2.35, 13.5, 34, you can just lay down your arrows and then add up the areas. Does that make sense? And then just double check your math. We are a little bit forgiving in the answers. But you can also get these numbers from the empirical rule. So if you only know the empirical rule, you can get it from there also. Um, I think I missed some questions earlier. I swear I did. Brian, from your error over is too small of an area. You're right. There you go. Um, I swear I asked you guys too many questions. And then do all of the answers have to be exact? Um, they have to be pretty good. Is this content evenly spread? It's pretty evenly spread. How similar is the questioning on the practice exam to the actual? Kind of close. Okay, let's do interpretation of regression. How's that sound? Yes, I guess. We've got some yeses over there. We like interpretation of regression. And then we'll take some more questions for individuals on what they want to know about the exam. Answer to question one is five million. <laughs> do not write that on the exam. Brian, told me <laughs> Brian said it was. It says the answer. No. It's on recording. The, all the answers to the test are Brian Stevens. If someone wrote that, <laughs> no, you make a zero. <laughs> do not do that. Do not. Brian Stevens said so. No, don't do that. Do not do that. Okay. Um, let's do a regression model here. Okay. You guys ready for some regression? Let's do um, how much you're going to eh, percent tips in a weird Let's do expensive coffee. Let's predict why people are buying coffee. And then let's predict it by, we used to have times you were arrested. Um, monthly selfies. Ooh, all right, give me a second. We'll make this data look better. <laughs> this is not legitimate statistics at the moment. Um, we're also gonna see a bunch of coloring to the points. All right. Here's how you make a relationship work. You ready? You go in here. Oh, wait, no, you do it the other way. Wait, wait for this. You go woo, like this. Okay. So now give me two seconds, everyone. We will have uh, data rows, invert row selection, um, rows, rows, hide and exclude. There we go. And now go right here, redo. Redo analysis. There we go. Okay, we got a positive linear relationship now. <laughs> um, here, let's clean up our point coloring. Seems accurate. Just you know, make it work. Uh, colors. What color you guys want? Light purple. Light purple. There we go. Okay. So there we go. Here is our regression analysis. It actually does seem to have a straight enough problem. You can see how the line does not. See that little bend at the end, like the points go above? I didn't intend that, but apparently there might be some sort of linearity problem. I'm wondering if there's a point I can't see that it is like off my thing, but um, sure. Um, so I wouldn't do this to you guys on the test or anything like that. I wanted it to be a, like a good regression analysis. Does that make sense? Like I wanted this to look pretty clean and pretty good. Let's just try one thing. Are you ready? Rows hide and exclude. This is my last attempt. If it doesn't look perfect, well, we'll deal with it. Um, redo analysis. Ay, ay, ay. Let's, let's do this. Let's remove these high outliers. Um, I just want what looks like a good regression analysis, and then we'll interpret it. So rows, hide and exclude. Last try, and here we go with interpreting. Good. This looks good enough. Okay. 
It's a little bit flat, but that's cool with me. Let's test, let's test the conditions of regression. Oh my gosh, we got a crowd in the audience today. You guys ready for this? Online, I'm, we're online, I wanna see, I wanna hear the chants online. You guys already know the chant class. I'm gonna need a cookie. You guys can chant it all at one time before I finish my cookie. You guys have 10 points everybody in class. You, you said no, no, I liked. I didn't hear my cookie. Oh man, online in class, 10 points. And I got a cookie, so I'm happy. So, good day for everybody. If you didn't hear it, QQ straighten up, no outliers. I literally had a guy drive by me in a car. He's like, QQ straighten up, no outliers. I was like, what does that mean? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just make people wrote memorize stuff. Um, but no, we don't want to memorize this. We want to understand what QQ straight enough no outliers means. We want to be able to say to somebody, well, the quantitative quantitative condition, and I accept QQ. If you're in another class, watch out with writing QQ. I tell my graders, QQ, well, as long as they tell you what it means, because usually you say, what does this condition mean? Well, you're always saying both variables are quantitative. Quantitative, quantitative. Do we meet the quantitative quantitative condition here? Yes. And you know how you explain that in an A plus manner? You say, Monthly selfies and expensive coffee are both quantitative variables. Both quantitative variables. Straight enough. The relationship between these two variables is well described by a line. That's all the straight enough condition is. Now the third condition is no outliers. And what do you see for this data? Is there really strong outliers here? Ah. <laughs> I tried, I tried. <laughs> Wait, where you see it? <laughs> try, just hide them right there. This is not so bad. Usually we try to make it more obvious. Like, don't be too picky. Um, like, you know, we really try to make it so it's like clear. We don't want to be like, is it? You know, we try to make it pretty obvious. Like, hey, Brian, can you send us some things? <laughs> I don't, I, I got cookies for my honors class. I bring donuts for you guys for the final. So you guys get donuts for the final. So there will be snacks on the test. There will be tests for the final. There will be snacks for the final. It's just I, I only ordered so many Girl Scout cookies, and I, I have other people I have to give them to. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have just ordered like 10 packs of Thin Mints. That would have worked for the exam, right? What am I doing? I'm not nice to you guys. Okay. So we passed QQ straight enough, no outliers, which means regression would be appropriate for this. There is a fourth condition for regression because we actually just gave – the three conditions, sorry Megan, we just gave the three conditions for correlation slash regression, and the fourth condition for regression is QQ straight enough, no outliers. Plot, bam, right there. Plot does not think, and five points to Scott. He got his only onliner. Five points in classrooms too, why not? Plot does not thicken. And you know what, are we, what plot are we talking about? The what plot? Ten points, tell me. I thought I heard it. Residual. Boom, right there, residual plot. So we're talking about that residual plot. We see right here the residual plot, and this one again, I'm gonna pretend we don't see certain things because I'm gonna try to make it look nice. Here, here's the graphic on the test, okay? We're gonna make it look nice. All right, there we go. <laughs> we're just pretending for a moment this is the test graphic. Does that make sense? And does that look like the plot does not thicken? Not really, right? It does not thicken, right? Usually we try to make it more obvious. If the plot thickens, it'll make a wedge. Like a plot thickening looks like a wedge or wedging in or out, and it could thicken or thinning. We don't want to see a change in the plot, right? The plot should look random. Does that look like someone just took paint and splattered it on it, like just randomly, like just dots? That's a good residual plot. It's pretty random there. It's just kind of splat, splat, splat. It's, I know they kind of make lines, but it's still kind of random. It's like, eh, there's no real pattern in there. Patterns are bad. I thought I saw a question in class. Uh, yeah. so correlation is three. Correlation is three. QQ straight enough. No outliers. Plot does not thicken. Regression has the fourth. So three conditions for correlation, and then regression is kind of an aggregate. It's kind of the next step. Because you can always get, because think, how do you get R squared from R? To get R squared, you square R. How do you get R from R squared? Square root it. Anytime you square root something, the root is blank or blank, plus or minus. How would you know that the correlation here is 
positive, it's going up. So the correlation here is positive because it has a positive linear relationship. So if the line goes up, correlation is positive. So if we were to square root r squared, then we could get the correlation. So I could take this right here, 0 0.49108. There's a homework assignment like this. It's the price of cars with the age. And if you don't use the negative, you get it wrong. So right here, so is this negative 0.22 or positive 0.22 correlation? Positive. So this is a linear, a, a moderately weak or kind of weakish positive linear relationship. Does that make sense? The form is linear. The strength is weak, 0.22, and the direction is positive. Strength, direction, form, and it does not have any unusual features. That's how we talk about correlation with strength, direction, form, unusual features. So uh, next, let's do some interpretation. I'm going to rewrite this equation just a little bit here to make it look nicer. Let's take away some decimals, and let's take a look. Oh, no, no, I didn't want to delete that. Whew. I wanted to delete some decimals. Sure. And let's just call this MS for monthly selfies. Good. Monthly selfies. Okay. Is it going to go to the next line? Don't go to the next line. Woo, we did it. Okay. So let's do some interpretation here. Are you guys ready? Interpret the intercept for me. And does it have an interpretation? Well, just think about this. The intercept here, ay, 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 one too many. The intercept here is what? Y hat equals B0 plus B1X. This bracket is zero. <laughs> I am the intercept. Um, two decimal places on the test. Say again, what is, what is the intercept? That's a good question, but be careful. What is the intercept is a different question than interpret the intercept. So the intercept is 5.25. That would answer, what is the intercept? But interpret the intercept. So units for expensive coffee is dollars. Great question, William. Five points. This is how much was the most expensive coffee you bought? So how do we interpret this intercept? Go ahead. I see it in the back of 10 points. Let's hear it. I'll take it. I think that would pass on the test. Do you want to try to, or you want a question? Uh-huh. So the intercept is this value right here because the intercept should not have the X variable. Because if you think classic algebra, it would be Y equals MX plus B. Where do you see the X? It's with the slope, right? So we say B0 plus B1X, which B0 is when X is equal to zero. I see some interpretations online that look really good. If you take zero month selfies this month, if you take zero selfies, the baseline is an average of 5.25 for the most expensive coffee someone has bought. So kind of make sure to say, and here I'm gonna give you my interpretation. For individuals who take zero selfies a month, we would expect them on average to have a most <coughs> expensive coffee of $5.25. Does that make sense? Because what happens for the y-intercept? It's when x is equal to what? Zero. That is the y-intercept. And where do you see this hitting right here? At 5.25. Does that make sense? So for individuals who take zero monthly selfies, we would expect their most expensive coffee bought to be $5.25. Does that make sense? Can you take zero monthly selfies? Is $5.25 a price of expensive coffee people could have? Yeah. This is an intercept that makes sense. It's logical. It doesn't mean it's true or anything. It just means it has an interpretation. For individuals who take zero monthly selfies, X is equal to zero, we would expect their most expensive coffee purchase to be $5.25. Great job, William, 10 points. Question. On the other graph, to the point two two, that was weak. Strength is this one or negative one, right? Correct. This right here? If it's perfectly strong, it's negative one. Yep. Perfect strength is negative one or one. The weakest possible is zero. Strength is considered the correlation, like a correlation of negative 0.22 is as strong as a correlation of 0.22. The close and linear strength, like you could have a relationship that's not linear, that's strong, but the linear strength of it is how close it is to negative one or one. Something with no linear strength has a correlation of zero. Great questions. Five points again. Yeah, we're not going to do, uh, why can't I think of it? Spearman. We're not going to do stuff like Spearman. There's other ways, but no. And you did not hear that S word. Take it out of your mind. So 
And guess what? I thought someone was already going to do it because if we interpret that intercept, next, what are we going to do? You know it. Interpret that slope. Here we go with interpreting the slope. Who can interpret that slope for 50 big points? If you can't tell, when this is on the test, I see people mess this up. I just see the slope is 5.25. Okay, here we go. And that, that was meant to be a horrible wrong answer. I will take it. I think that's a great, I think that's an A. I can put it to the A plus, but that was perfect. Like what you just said there, I'm gonna say what was said there and it, it would pass, it'd be fine on the exam. You're done with that question. Because the blanket interpretation is, for each one unit increase in X, we expect Y to increase by B1. For each one unit increase in X, we expect Y to increase by B1. And I implore you, I'm not gonna write this out in Word, because I beg of you to go to the problems, because I am almost 100% certain in these regression problems. I've heard this song a billion times. <laughs> I was like, this is such a nice song. And I'm like, oh God, I hate this song. Uh, on average, the intercept is logical, yada, yada, yada. Where's my slope interpretation? I swear we interpret the slope here. Doing predictions, yada, yada. Where's that slope? For each one pound increase, I also have it in the chapter review, but I show you where it's at. So this is the practice test where I circled right here. For each one pound increase, we expect the height, because that's the Y, of a nursing student to increase by B1. For each one unit increase in X, in this problem right here, X is a one pound increase. For each one unit increase in X, X is weight. We expect Y, which is height, to increase by B1. You don't have to say the on average part, I don't care. People like it sometimes. But now when we look at our problem, for each one more monthly selfie that someone takes. Does that make sense? Because it's a one increase in monthly selfie. For each one more monthly selfie that someone takes, we expect their most expensive coffee that they've bought to increase by 8.4 cents. You could say $0.084, that's fine too. But, and what you gave is an A answer. And we would not take off any points, but you could also include the units of the problem to say, for each one more monthly selfie that someone takes, we would expect their most expensive coffee that they bought to increase by $0.084. And I give that in terms of dollars, or you could say 8.4 cents. So for every one more monthly selfie, um, and then careful, so Allison, make sure you say the most expensive coffee someone um, bought, we would expect to increase by 0.084. Careful with the 84 cents, Caroline. Uh, so double check with what we just wrote there. I see some pretty good explanations in the chat. Uh, so did everyone get it? I, and I repeated it a few times. Does everyone understand how to interpret the intercept? For each one unit increase in X, we expect Y to increase by B1. And I'm pretty sure if you go to the chapter reviews on linear correlation, this is why I'm not rewriting them, and I beg of you to watch these videos. That's Josiah Wilkinson, a really great artist. Um, yes, when X is equal to zero, we expect Y to equal B zero on average. And then guess what? You go a little bit forward. And careful, I do say increase a lot. I, I realize I might have been making this mistake right here, but for each one unit increase in X, we expect Y to, be careful if the slope is negative, it'll increase or decrease by B one on average. You have to fill in what X, and you do have to fill in one unit, sometimes it makes it a little bit better. But does everyone see this video right here showing you exactly, and then you will hear me constantly say the interpretation about 10 times. It was very important to the process there once again. For each additional time someone texts on Wednesday. I, I really remember saying the things like 10 times in these videos. So please check out these videos. Please review. For each one unit increase in X, we expect Y to increase or decrease, depending on the slope of the line, by B1 on average. Brian's like, you always said it's increased. No, it's just happened to be in this problem increase and the sample problem I gave you. So there's some really great interpretations right there. And also we have one more thing to interpret here. Dun, dun, dun. R squared. Who wants to do it for 20 points? You can round it to 5%. On the test, maybe use the decimals. Let's just say 5%. Go ahead for 20 points. We got it right here. 5% of the variation expensive. 
Boom, right there. 5% of the variation in most expensive coffee is explained by monthly selfie. What does the explaining? The X variable. 5% of the variation in monthly, oh, in expensive coffee is explained by monthly selfie. X's do the explaining. Um, you can find these videos on the YouTube channel. And also, if you go to the Stat 201 homepage, I don't know why this image doesn't load sometimes. You can go to exam prep. And under exam prep, you will find this right here. If you can't find the page, you should see, um, did I not, I thought I posted it. Exam prep posted. So if you're looking for where the exam prep is at, go to the announcements and boom, you'll be right on the exam prep. And there's that image that should go there. Where did he get the 5%? The 5% is found right here under R squared. So that R squared right there is where we get the 5%. Now the R squared adjusted, do not worry about that. We don't talk about it in this class, so we're not gonna try to trick you, but the 5% is found right there where we were saying R squared. We rounded it just to talk about it a little bit nicer. But 5% of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. So if we look at uh, chapter seven once again, I think I give you that blank in interpretation. Zero. 500 times on Wednesday. Oh, there's my emulator. I thought I put that interpretation on here too. Transitions. Oh, wait, wait. There it is. Blank percent of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. Blank percent of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. So if I see it right here. 74.05% of the variation in Saturday text amount is explained by the variation in Wednesday text amount. Does that make sense? 74.05% of the variation in Saturday text amount is explained by the variation in Wednesday text amount. So that's what we have right there. Questions, questions, questions. See if there's any questions. What do you guys want to review now? We got time for one more big topic. What are we gonna review while I tie my shoe? What shall we review? Go ahead, quick question. Yeah, someone else was asking eight on the practice test. So the, go ahead, eight on the practice test. Sure, let's go to practice test topics, not topics, eight, part two. Okay, what about it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Based on the mosaic plot, at what time of the day were the Icelandic dolphins observed the least? So what these are on the bottom right here is actually a marginal display. So the bigger, think about this as a pizza, like a big sheet pizza. And imagine you're really hungry and I said, you can have either the morning, afternoon, or evening slices of the pizza. Which slices of the pizza would you take if you're really hungry? The evening, which slices of the pizza would you take? And I'm talking the full, all the slices under that category. If you were the least hungry, you would take which ones? The morning. So the width of these bars are actually a marginal display. You could actually use these as bar charts themselves. Like this is the bar of it, this is the bar, and this is the bar. So this is the smallest bar when you just look at it sideways. So those are marginal displays showing you that they were observed the least in the morning. Now this is also a marginal display over here. Which of these three activities occurred the least? Social. This is a marginal display of their activities. So the outer portions, the margins, have the univariate marginal displays, which are just univariate categorical. Like if you just look at this edge right here, you can only see the periods of the times they were observed. If you just look at this, you can only see the activities. But when you look inside, you see a bivariate categorical display. And that's what a mosaic plot is. A mosaic plot is a bivariate categorical display of data that allows us to observe what's going on, if there's a relationship or not between two categorical variables. <clears throat> it's a great question. Does that help explain it? There's, there's people outside with suits. How do you determine the relationship with whether or not there's a Whether or not there's a relationship is a good question. Let's view that. To see if there's a relationship with the data, Let's do some examples right here. And I like this example. We need to see who Brian's gonna let pass for the class. So let's go, let's do this, uh, grade. Or let's do this. Um, oh gosh. Let's do, um, let's go gamers versus not gamers. 
Okay. So you say Brian has a preference for gamers. So he's like, Brian only lets people play video games past the class. You go tell that to UT and they're like, that's crazy. And you say, I've done statistical analysis of it. So these are the gamers that pass. These are the great gamers that fail. These are the people who are not gamers who pass. These are the gamers who are not gamers who fail. Does that make sense? You're either a gamer or not a gamer. You either pass or you don't pass. So let's go 100, um, 10, uh, 10, 100. Okay. So now we're going to analyze this. And we're going to see if being a gamer will explain if somebody passes the test. You do not need to know how to do this kind of stuff. I'm just going to show you a graphic here. And whoa, look at the gamers. What do you notice about those gamers right here? They are more likely to pass. So if you notice the gamers, the difference is in the widths of the bars, as in like when you see, excuse me, the inside where we have a much larger change here. Does that make sense? Where if there really wasn't something, let's say 50, 50, 50, 50, now look at this. Well, this doesn't make anyone feel good for the class. So let's change this to five and let's change this to five right here. Makes you feel a little bit better about the class now, right? Isn't this the way it should be? Now to tell if there is an association, <laughs> Scott's like, I'm a gamer, I got this, I got this class. Five points to Scott for being a gamer from passing the class. So, so with this in mind right here, when you look at this, now if somebody's not a gamer, what, let's look at here, I'll make the numbers really easy for you guys, 45 and 45. What percent, because remember there's 50 people who are gamers and there's 50 people who are not gamers, right? What percent of non-gamers fail the class? Five out, of, five out of 50, so 10%. What percent of gamers fail the class? So does it really, does the percent of people who pass or fail really depend on if they're a gamer? But as soon as I do this, sorry gamers, there's not that many gamers apparently now. But you see, there's not as many gamers, so what happened to the width of the yes on the bottom? Because now there's only 15 gamers. It got smaller because this is the marginal display of 15 versus 50. Does that make sense where the numbers are coming from? And then what we see here is what percent of gamers failed? Five out of 15, 33%. Do you see how these numbers are changing? And now you might say to me, hmm. When you can't say Brian's failing the gamers because this wasn't an experiment, but you could say, I observe more gamers. So sorry, gamers. Let's go back. Let's, let's go. Uh, there we go. <laughs> But the bigger the difference in the widths of the bars, or not the widths, excuse me, the bigger the difference within the marginal displays, oh, I can't speak today, guys. Are we going to rewind everything I said? The bigger the difference in the conditional display, given somebody is not a gamer versus given somebody is a gamer, that's a conditional display, the bigger the association. So I can make this an even bigger association by making it an even bigger difference. So here we see a much bigger difference in the widths in the conditional displays, I ate today, just not enough. So I see a much bigger difference in the conditional displays telling me that there is much more evidence of an association. Because when you go from condition not gamer to condition gamer, the whys change. So when we go back to our practice test and we see here, and we had to open on the page right here, right? Where were you practice test? When we see this right here, does the activity the dolphin is doing depend on what time of day it is. I told you, I observed the dolphins feeding. You'd say, oh, you probably went out during what time? Evening, because during the evening, they're much more likely to be feeding. So here we see different activities based on what time of day it is. So with this in mind, the activity does sort of depend. But imagine each bar was completely flat across then would the activity really depend on what time of day it is? No, it'd be the same kind of ratio of activities. So if there's an association, what you will generally see is that inside the condition for an X, given it's morning, will be different than another X, given it's evening, and we see a different conditional display. The insides are the conditional displays. The, the ends of it, the margins, I didn't want to say margins twice, are the marginal displays. It's like the margins are the marginal displays. But that doesn't tell you the bivariate relationship. You'd have to look at the conditional displays and see if they vary. And these do vary because you'd be like, oh, they were feeding. They probably went during evening. Oh, they were traveling. Yeah, probably went during afternoon. They're more likely to be traveling during afternoon than evening, telling you that there is an association between period and activity. Maybe Brian plays PCA. 
No, I'm, I've been playing Switch lately. <laughs> it's a shame I have to be Microsoft Player once. Xbox or PS. I'm, I'm Xbox. I am Xbox One. But I've been playing Switch. I need to get Celeste for that. So look, it's, it's telling me right here to get Celeste. So if you, if you guys know what game that is, I don't know. It looks like Megan might have played Celeste or Switch, or I don't know. All the points for Brian. <laughs> have you played Celeste, Megan? Is that what it is? There we go. I need to get it. I've been hearing great things. Question in class. Let's go ahead. Yeah, so independent dependence is the same term we're using right here for is there a relationship or not. Okay. To say that uh, y depends on x, think about that. Does y depend on x right here? If, like, if I change x, does it change y to a certain degree? Does y depend on x? Yeah. And if they're independent, then changing x would have no, in, no effect. So dependent is the same word as relationship or association because they're associated. They, one tells you something about another. They're dependent. So same words, really. Um, <laughs> I like that. Five points to Scott and... And uh, I think it's Parker. So uh, I'll take it. Okay. Let's, let's handle another big question. we got time for another big one. Is it from the practice test or do you want to hear a concept reviewed in our final minutes together today? What concept? From what chapter? What chapter would you like to hear more on? Surely anything. Go ahead, question. Go ahead. Uh, you see, okay, so that is an extended topic, which I like including because I think it shows you that when there's an outlier, it can do anything. So the question was, on some of your ELQ, there's a leverage idea. Leverage is how far it is away on the X. The further it is away, the more of an, ooh, the more of an outlier it is extrapolating away from the data. Like if it's really far away on the X axis, we're extrapolating, right? So something that is far away could be an extrapolation and it has more leverage. You don't need to know the term leverage for the test, but I did like those problems. Like for some of the things they covered in the ELQs, because an outlier can do what? An outlier can make R squared stronger, it can make it weaker, and R squared is an aggregate of R, so outliers can change correlation. They can make correlation stronger, and that's a good concept to know, that these things that are far away points can make correlation stronger, weaker, R squared stronger, weaker, they can do anything. Great question. Go ahead, another one? Sure. So leverage is how far it is away, and this was not defined in the lecture, so something can have a high residual, which is how far it is away on the x-axis. So this right here is a pretty big residual, but it doesn't have much leverage. Because you ever, you ever go on like a, a seesaw? And imagine you have a seesaw and you jump down on the end of it and your friend's on the other side. Your friend's gonna, what's gonna happen to them? Like let's say your friend's a, a five-year-old. <laughs> and and you're, you're a big 300-pound football player and you jump down on the far side of it. They're gonna go, woo, like that, right? But what if you jump down in the exact middle of that seesaw? I'm, what's going to happen? Well, but think about yourself. You're going to land on metal and it's going to hurt, right? Because you had no what in the middle of it. You had no leverage. So leverage is how far away you are on the X space. And this is, it's such a good concept, which will not be on the test. You will not hear the word leverage on the test, but you might hear residual. Residual is kind of how high you jump. So if you think about how far you are above the seesaw, that's kind of your residual, how far you are away from that line. Does that make sense? But residual is just how far you are away. As you can see here, this is one of the biggest residuals because it's the farthest away. I saw another question. we got three more minutes. Go ahead, question in the back. Did you have one? I thought I said a hand raise. Awesome. Can outliers change correlation sign? You bet they can change correlation sign. Um, outliers can easily make a positive correlation negative. They can make a flat correlation positive. Outliers can do what? Starts with an any, ends with thing. They can do? Nice. Outliers can do anything. They can destroy correlation. They can make correlation. They can destroy R squared. They can make R squared. They can do anything. They can make it zero. They can make it positive, make it negative, anything. That's why we say QQ straight enough. No outliers. Because we don't like them because they can, they can make a relationship that we're not really describing. It'll, it'll, it's not representative. It's representative of the outlier, though. We've got time for like two more. Go ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. ah. no, so remember, when it comes to skewed distributions, here's what I want you to say in your head when it comes to skewed distributions. Right to the high, left to the low. Right to the high, left to the low. You can be tricked by things like stem and leaf plots. 
because if you kind of topple the stem and leaf plot, you might topple it in a reverse fashion. I'm trying to look for one of these that topples reverse. Sometimes we see one of those. None of these are toppling in reverse. But if it's skewed to the left, it's skewed to the low. If it's skewed to the right, it's skewed to the high. Do you see where there's only a tiny bit of skew to this one, only a tiny bit of pull to one side? The pull to the one side of this is the pull on the which side? The right side, these little ones right here. This is generally symmetric with, and I, wouldn't, I would probably use the mean and standard deviation for this because it's generally symmetric with a tiny bit of pull. This one is very symmetric. Um, this one, I don't love that one. This one right here, is it skewed to the left or skewed to the right? Skewed to the left because the tail goes to the low side. Does that make sense? The low numbers right here, skewed to the left. Always remember, left to the low, right to the high. Left to the low, right to the high. When you see this one right here, here's where I'd say the tail is going. This is not a quintessential one. Uh, it's hard to find perfect things for my examples. Uh, we'll go with this one. If this was the tail right here, it'd have a little skew to the right. Let's look at one more. There's gotta be one more great example on here. Where's a skewed stem and leaf plot? No. Well, that's a weird bimodal one. Middle, Middle at the top right here? No. <laughs> that's horrible stem and leaf right there. Oh, wait, write this. Skewed to the, oh, and this is the one. This is what I wanted. Skewed to the right or skewed to the left? You guys were not tricked because if you topple it, the line is actually reverse. So when you drop it down, you'd be counting nine, eight, seven, six, four, five. So when you see the tail going to the right, it's actually to the left when you mirror image it. So if you remember in your head, skewed to the left or left to the low, right to the high, that tail goes towards the what side? The low side. It's towards the low. Left to the low, right to the high. It could be, you never know. Um, we don't try to make tricks, but these things do appear. Um, we just create data. And obviously by virtue of multiple things appearing like this, people write stem and leaves like this. And then you get the, you just have to know, left is the tail being pulled to the low side, right is the high side. Left is also negative. We don't use that, I shouldn't even say other terminology. Like we won't hit you with a terminology we've never told you, but we do want you to know that skewed left is when the tail is pulled to the left side. So this is skewed left because the tail is going to the left. It's, it's slightly symmetric with a little bit of left skew. We could make it more left skewed, but that pull to the left is the low side. So questions, you guys can pack up, you can go. I'm gonna keep answering questions for the last few moments here, but go ahead, ask the questions, go ahead. Identifiers, um, mm -hmm. Identifiers cannot, will not ever repeat no matter what. So if someone asks you your favorite ice cream flavor, could another person give you the same favorite ice cream flavor? Yeah. So if you had a small data set of favorite ice cream flavors, maybe they wouldn't repeat. That doesn't make them identifiers though. Just because something did not repeat doesn't mean it's not an identifier. If it has the ability to repeat, it's an, if it has the ability to repeat, it's not an identifier. Anything that cannot, will not ever repeat is an identifier. That's it. Cookie Tom. Transaction number is an identifier because if I call up Amazon and I say, oh, I'm calling about transaction number 58412B, would they say, oh, wait, we have two of those transaction numbers. Can a transaction number on Amazon ever repeat? Never. Social security numbers for a lot of data sets cannot, will not ever repeat unless they're using your social security number as your visit. Like they say, this was this visitor. Does that make sense? Because if they're using it as like your visitor thing, like, you know, I mean, this is a weird thing. So this is where I talk about the nuance of it. Like they say who visited us and it's social security number. They were just recording who visited. Could someone visit again? And in this example, the identifier would be visit number. If they were visit number 54, could we have two visitor number 54s? No, so the ID, the identifier in that data set would be visitor number, because really social security number is just a category of visits by that visitor. So it, I know social security number can't repeat, it wouldn't repeat in a government data set to say like, uh, where are people located in the United States? Could we have someone in there twice? Like current locations, like this is like Big Brother spying on us, like current locations of people. Don't worry, I hope it's not like this. <laughs> so um, that would not repeat because we would just have a person's social security number and then we'd have their location or something like that. And so we could have repeats of locations, but we would never repeat of a social security number because they should only have been there once because we only should have one data point for where they're at. We could then have their age, which would be quantitative. We could have um, how many siblings they have, which would be quantitative. We could have their gender, categorical, all that stuff right there. 
Uh, you can use the TI-84, you can use it. Another question, class question you got here? So Go ahead ask. Yeah. Two, or could they be like decimals ever? Um, yeah, they could be. Um, you're talking about just, yeah, so the standard deviation, well, the z-scores will always be whole numbers on the curve right here. So whenever you do the z-scores, zero, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative right. three. When you do it in context, like if we were to say exam scores are normally distributed with a mean of 70 and a standard deviation of eight, then we would put those on the curve. But once again, down here, you would just put zero, one, two, three, okay. negative one, negative two, negative three. Okay. Yep. And this could have a decimal too, like that. It could be like that. And I hate that sometimes it doesn't include the numbers. Oh, and from that point, you would make it. So you would just add the numbers there. there. Okay, that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Like, Question. Normally, mm -hmm. for a normal, normally you continue this normal adjustment, but with age, the whole number is considered. Age is actually continuous. Yeah, I'm saying age is considered mm -hmm. continuous. Is there anything else besides like, in, like age that's a whole number and continuous? Well, that's because, you know, you're always, I could say I'm 36.1 years old. Gosh, I've already like aged another, no, I'm like 36.08 years old. No! Um, and you would know Brian had his birthday around a month ago, right? Actually, it's the 20th, right? I had my birthday one month ago, so I'm one twelfth of a year older. So I guess that's around 30, I'm 36.0833%. I'm a math nerd, guys. I think that's correct. So I'm 38.0833, and that actually means I am 38 and one month, or 36 and one month, <laughs> 36.0833. So I can tell you that by telling you a continuous number for it, right? So it actually has meaning. But if I tell you I own 1.2 dogs, say, what's going on here? You say, well, my girlfriend's in a vet school. It's, it's a weird story. <laughs> Half of that's true, she is in vet school. But um, you would start to question, you know, like what's going on with 1.2 dogs. So that would be a discrete, that should be a discrete number. You can't say number of pets and not be discrete unless you're giving it in a weird way that we don't usually give it. It, it doesn't make logical sense. Um, like ordering pizzas, you could have, because pizza can be continuous or discrete, because you could have one and a half pizzas in your refrigerator. But do a lot of pizza places accept discrete orders? No, you can't order 1.5 pizzas. We learned that the hard way. So um, there's a lot of things that we usually give in discrete values, like, um, you know, like how many minutes till you'll get here, say 10, that's a discrete value of minutes. But you said 10.2 uh, minutes. Hey, what's up? It's like, everyone's looking so nice. So you said 10.2 minutes, does that have a meaning? Yeah, 10.2 minutes means something. It means uh, I'm gonna get here in 10 minutes and 12 seconds. But if someone says 10.2 minutes, you probably just say, okay, 10 minutes, right? You'd be like, why, why do you give me weird numbers? Why do you make me do math in my head? Right. The last question. Huh? Like, on the, like, the review, like, huh? I miss just, I still, Oh, like, no. I don't miss anything. I still don't really get skewness when, I, I get the skewness when you see the tail, mm -hmm. but, like, the, I don't get, like, the, like, with this box plot. No, we need so it is hard to tell skew from these. So the distribution of the male shower times, it's got high values. You see how this is pulled out more? Yeah. So since this is pulled more, it's being pulled to the high side or the low side? It's being pulled to the high side. Yep. And think about this. Can it be, I mean, it is weird if someone's like, I take a two minute shower every morning. You'd be like, well, that's weird. But there's a lot more people going towards the high. Like I take a 25, I take a 30 minute shower. I take a 50 minute shower. I take an hour long shower. So on the box plot, it's almost better to look at like horizontally this way. You'd have to, if you looked at it this way, cause here's how, cause this is to the right now cause the number line is properly oriented. So if you looked at it this way, you could see it's pulled to the right side. You see like, this is the zero to 25th, 25th to 50th, but the 50th, um, the, there's more here where it is from the 75th to the non-extreme outliers. So this tail is pulled out more, it's pulled to the right. So we can't totally tell the shape from it, but we do see more of a pull towards the right and the outliers are on the right. See, like the, when I looked at this, I was like, I thought it was skewed left. When I looked at it, I was like, well, it's pushed this way, but I was going to hit this way. But because your number line here is reversed, because usually you count 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, but you're counting down. So if you just flip it to the proper orientation. Yeah. Okay. And then it's pulled to the right side. It's like because I understand. It's, I understand the skewness of like where the, where the tail's pulled. It's just when it's the, when the um. Does that look like maybe this distribution? You see like the middle there, yeah. and then it's pulled like that's because you have to keep going if it's there because there's data underneath here, and then you've got like your outliers and an outlier there. But this right here, because we're pulling this out more, that's what that tail is doing. Or if you had a box plot that looked like this, um, this would look more symmetric like that. 
you know, I, I mean, I get like where, wherever the tail goes. It's like where your skewness is. It's just if you don't see it, it is. Where is it? That's a like, really good like question. I just gotta make sure. You just gotta actually to make sure it on the test. Left to the low, know. right to the high, because this is to the high side. Pulled to the high, right to the high, left to the low. If the tail yeah. was pulled to the low side, it would be to the left. Yeah. This is pulled yeah. to the right. Like the only reason, the only way, the only way I can get confused yeah. is when like when the when the axis is different. That's what confuses me. Just like, just try to think. I, I like to say left to the low, right to the high. I think that helps keep yeah. your brain straight on it. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Yay! Well, we're gonna log off here. Are there any questions? Question. Calculator, whatever calculator you want, the, the math won't be that hard. I would suggest bringing the calculator, but I mean, you could do it on a little pocket calculator. Like you'd have a little rinky dink, you know, like got out of a cereal box literally. And so you could do that. Um, so I suggest bringing the calculator, uh, show up like 10, 15 minutes early, get a good seat. Um, we might keep the front row clear. No. No, they, it's, the thing is, is as I keep saying, they, they kind of expect you to have it be, because they expect you to use like the normal curve and everything, but we try to give you guys a better understanding of it so it's not like magic. We don't want you guys to punch things into a calculator and be like, oh, I have no idea why this number just appeared. Because as I, that's, that, that's what it was, right? You're like, oh, punch in a number, and then you do step A, step B, step C, number, reject the null, done. Well, and so that's why we don't use tables because, like, give me a number on this curve, like any number. Four. Well, four is going to be zero <laughs> because there's really no area above four. So I know that instant. That's why I don't need that table because I'm like, oh, above four, there's zero. Give me another number. Give me a decimal number. 2.25. That's going to be right about, don't tell me. That's almost near an idiot. That's going to be right about 2. Point, wait, my brain's breaking. I say two point, oh no, 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 no. It's gonna be 1.6%, I gotta get this right today, 1.2%. But the thing is, is I could go here and get the exact answer, but I knew it was around 1%. And you can kind of do that too with the empirical rule, and that's why we teach you the empirical rule, is so you can, not that you can guess these things, but I know that it's gonna be around 1%. I should've just said, eh, it's about 1%, which is what my brain was thinking, and I would've been closer than 1.6. Careful, 2.5 because from here over is 2.5 and 0.15. Yep, and I actually knew another number. I know two point, I know more numbers than you guys, so I know 2.3263, and this'll be 1%. So I know, I know that number, so I knew it was a little bit more than one, because, <laughs> because I know 2.5758 is 0.05. How many numbers do I know? 1.645, 1 1.96, I know a lot of numbers. I know all the way from like four, five, I know what area is inside of four, five, six, and seven. It's 99.99, 99.99999, 99.9999999, and 99 .99 .99 .99 .99 .99 .99 I think I did one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the seventh is seven nines. You say 99.9999999, seven nines. It's called Wikipedia. Um, yeah, Wikipedia, empirical rule. They show you, um, the areas inside of the standard deviation is a little bit lower down. Look, that's a beautiful graph. If someone finally, and they used exact decimals though. That's why that's confusing. And then they have a table on here and you see on the seventh is it's 99 point, And then that should be seven nines if I'm doing it currently. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh no, I've been messing it up. You, okay, I need to review this. <laughs> All right. But these are the, these are the exact numbers like 68.26, but I guess it's 68.27. 95.45, 95.4499. But don't worry. I mean, yeah. But here's the thing. What should you know? 68, 95, 99.7, which you see on here as the 68, 95, 99.7. But there's still area outside of that, but we don't care about that usually because it's so small. Because that's when you said four, I said, well, it's going to tell me zero because there's basically nothing. I just Question. Want to, yeah, I just want to ask right up wise. We try to give a deeper, since it's business school, we try to. Yeah. Right up wise is this full points. Four. Yep. Yes, the points form a roughly linear relationship, and then it's the outlier. There, bam! That is that is a plus work because you because even says in here like there's an outlier or something like to remove it, but yep. that's perfect. And then I did the relationship. Mm -hmm.
Would that be accurate to say? Just like how I During the morning, the officer observed the least because the width of morning on the SS is, is the smallest. Yeah, perfect. Okay. And then it's roughly 50. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, great. Cool. Nice job. Thank you. I think I see an outliner question. Are, is there any left handed seats reserved? Just wondering because some of my other classes have them. I think there should be, Megan. I think pretty much all classes have that. All rooms should have that availability. Um, and as long as we have, um, I'll make sure if you come in and say there's no left-handed seats, I'll ask someone to move. I'll say, we need a left-handed seat. And I'll tell you this much, I'm a right-handed person. I would rather sit, are you guys all right-handed? I'd rather sit in a right-handed seat than a left-handed. So, I, I mean, I think, yeah. Um, I have watched the videos. Is that the best review for the test? I'd say the videos are some of the top review. Um, so watch the videos, practice up. Um, the videos are some of the best review for the test, I'd say. Watch the chapter review videos, email me questions, uh, do the test yourself like you were filling it out. That's just good practice. I mean, it's one thing to like see an answer on the screen and be like, yeah, that's the right answer. It's another thing to like practice writing it because you learn more when you write. Like you actually have to like think it and then everything you write, you have to think. Uh, either one. Oh, uh, this, is my last, this is my last question. We looked at, mm. You look at this p-value because it's, just, because it's talking about the arm length and that's what the graph's about? Because that's the x, because we want to see if the x explains. So the x oh. is the significant one. Yep. Everybody, inhale. Like, what? The one that's on my ATK that's like is the second one, not your first one? Because apparently. We had to have it memorized. See, like, like one person. Bye, everybody. Well, like, it was annoying because like, we had, like, a certain format. Like, yeah. Like, but it wasn't, like, 23 points. It was 20 points that would be taken off of your school. If you forgot.